Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be getting started on my review of Alien 3 by Alan Dean Foster. So this is based on the movie. I've read Alien and Aliens by Foster, and uh, this is the third of the three. I will link below to my previous reviews. And here we go, I'll give you the blurb before I start, you know, going in and looking at some of my tabs. Here, even the wind screams. Abandoned hulks of machinery rust in the colourless landscape. Dark, oily seas beat against the jagged black shore and the remnants of a recent space vehicle crash into the rough waves. In it sleeps Ripley, a woman who has battled the enemy twice. It killed a whole crew the first time. The second time it slaughtered a spaceload of death-dealing marines. Now, on this prison planet that houses only a horde of defiant captive men, she will have to fight the ultimate alien horror one more time, before it rips apart a whole world. And this starts really brutally. Basically, she discovers that all of her previous crewmates, including one that was a small child, are now all dead, you know? I'm going to read this little chapter here because I think it's a nice little nod to uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick as well. The machine that was the Sulaco was doing its job. The four sleepers on board alternately dreamt and rested, speeding along their pre-programmed course coddled by the best technology civilization could devise. It kept them alive, regulated their vitals, treated momentary blips in their systems. Ripley, Hicks, Newt, even Bishop, though what was left of Bishop was easy to maintain. He was used to being turned on and off. Of the four, he was the only one who didn't dream, didn't have nightmares. It was something he regretted. It seemed like such a waste of time to sleep but not to dream. However, the designers of the advanced android series to which he belonged would have regarded dreaming as an, as an expensive frivolity and therefore did not apply themselves to the resolution of the problem. Naturally, no one thought to inquire of the androids what they thought of the, solution, of the situation. Then we get the scene where uh, Ripley has to shave her head and uh, I actually think uh, Sigourney Weaver with a shaved head looks even more badass, uh, in the movie at least anyway. But it's explained here because they're on this sort of prison colony and there's problems with lice. She's also the only woman there which I imagine from what I remember as well is going to cause some interesting uh, some uh, interesting conflict as well. But we will see. Okay so I'm going to read some more of my flags from Alien. So here we get um, some foreshadowing and we start to see the alien making an appearance. So I'm going to read this out because it's pretty cool. There was movement in the abattoir, a stirring amid the dangling carcasses and balletic wraiths of frozen air. The massive corpse of the ox twitched, then began to dance crazily in its chains. There was no one to witness the gut swelling and expanding until the dead skin was taut as that of a crazed dirigible. No one to see it burst under the pressure, sending bits of flesh and fat flying. Internal organs, liver and stomach, coils of ropey intestines tumbled to the floor, and something else. A head lifted, struggling upward with spasmodic, instinctive confidence. The compact nightmare turned a slow circle, scanning its surroundings, hunting. Awkward, awkwardly at first, but with astonishingly rapid assurance, it began to move, searching. It found the air duct and inspected it briefly before vanishing within. From, from the time it had emerged from the belly of the ox until its steady disappearance, less than a minute had elapsed. I'm going to read this as well. Okay, I just think that Alan Dean Foster does a really good of, job of writing this kind of horror, you know, I guess. Yeah, like sci-fi horror. There was something up there, something on the ceiling. It was big and black and fast and its face was a vision of pure hell. As he stared open-mouthed, it leaned down, hanging like a gigantic back from its clawed hind legs and enveloped Boggs' head in a pair of hands with fingers like articulated cables. Boggs inhaled sharply, gagging on his own vomit. With an abrupt, convulsive twist, the arachnoid horror jerked Boggs' head right off his shoulders, as cleanly as Golic would have removed a loose bolt from its screw, but not as neatly. Blood fountain from the headless torso, spluttering the creature, rains his body, the staring Golic. It, it broke his paralysis, but in the process also snapped something inside his head. And then we get some backstory from uh, Clemens. Uh, we find out he used to be a doctor, but he got struck off because he was a drug, drug addict, basically. And... Uh, yeah, so let me read this bit out. So uh, we get we get to, um, basically he served some time in the jail that the book set in and he says, I got to know this Motley crew quite well, so when they stayed, I stayed. Nobody else would employ me. He moved to give her the injection. So, will you trust me with an injector? As he was leaning toward her, the alien hit the floor behind him as silently as it fell from the ceiling, landing in a supportive crouch and straining to its full height. It was astonishing and appalling how something that size could move so quickly. She saw it come erect, towering over the smiling medic, metallic incisors gleaming in the pale overhead light. Even as she fought to make her paralysed vocal cords function, part of her noted that it was different slightly in appearances from every alien type she had encountered previously. The head was fuller, the body more massive, the more subtle physical discrepancies registered as brief observational ticks in the frozen instant of horror. Clemens leaned toward her, suddenly more than merely concerned. 
Hey, what's wrong? You look like you're having trouble breathing. I can... The alien ripped his head off and flung it aside. Still, she didn't scream. She wanted to. She tried, but she couldn't. Oh, I thought this was interesting. Somebody gets, like, burned to death, basically. It says, In the main access corridor, smoke inhalation toppled another man. The last thing he saw as he went down was the alien rising before him, silhouetted by the flames and the incredible heat. He tried to scream too, but failed. In space, no one can hear you scream. I wonder if that was a deliberate reference. I think this is an interesting conversation as well, so, uh... This, this guy says, Why do we have to kill it anyway if the company's coming for it? Let them worry about it. She held her temper. I told you, they're going to try to take it back to Earth. He shrugged indifferently. What's wrong with that? It will destroy them. They can't control it. I told you, it will kill them all. Everyone. He lay on his back, eyeing the ceiling and puffing contentedly. Like I said, what's wrong with that? Oh, I found this little typo here. It says, look, shithead, you can screw you precious regulations. So it's meant to say your precious regulations. There was another one somewhere as well, but I can't seem to find where it was. But all in all, I did enjoy reading this. It was probably my least favourite of the three books, but then it's my least favourite of the three films. And yeah, it's kind of gone kind of along with how the films were for me, really. So Alien 3, 3.5 out of 5, it was all right. And uh, I'm pretty glad I read it. I doubt I'll ever reread it. Would I recommend it? Yes, if you like the Alien movies, but start with Alien 1 first, because that one was, was cracking. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Alien 3 by Alan Dean Foster. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.